please like, subscribe, and be sure to click that bell button for regular and exciting indie film content and your chance to be the first to engage with the Liftoff Global Network of Film Festivals as we embark on launching the careers of the filmmakers of tomorrow. Hello everyone and welcome to today's stream. Today we are looking at the Berlin Audience Choice winners and we have four fantastic filmmakers here representing their films. I'm gonna throw it straight over to the filmmakers uh, but I have seen that there are quite a few people watching so if you do have any questions for our filmmakers throughout today's stream, then please ask away. Mo, I'm gonna throw it over to you first. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about your project. Uh, I'm Mo Rebeck, uh, who works under the artist named Robodrome. Um, uh, my, uh, my film is called Download My Heart in the Metaverse, which is an outgrowth of um, uh, my, the world's first app song series called uh, Download My Heart, Download My Heart in London, uh, then Download My Heart in New York, and Download My Heart in LA, uh, Download My Heart in Dubai, and Download My Heart in the Metaverse. Amazing. Um, and um, uh, that's it's a it's a it's a tour of uh, the, the the metaverse as we as we see it uh, at the beginning of um, of this uh, metaverse AI era. Absolutely, and we're going to delve into technology as soon as we hit your project. So be prepared for a journey in the the metaverse and the world of the future. I guess, uh, Vanessa, why don't you introduce yourself and your project, please? Um, yes, hello, I'm Vanessa Weber von Schmoller, long name. <laughs> I'm from Munich, Germany, and um, our movie is called Ein Himmel voller Bienen in German, and in English it's Let It Be. And I think in English it actually works a lot better because Let It Be is a bit of a wordplay and a positive vision and shows exactly what we wanted to aim with uh, producing this movie. It's about solutions and it's about... Um, how we can all do something to preserve and help, um, especially the wild bees um, on this planet. And uh, yeah, the documentary is long, it's uh, I think 87 minutes long. Amazing, I, we're gonna start with your film and I'm very excited to find out more about how this project was born and everything that you had to do in order to get it to where it is today. And I do think the title is way better in English with let it be, spelled B-E-E, -E. so yeah, it's exciting. Okay, great. Fabian, hi, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, yes, um, uh, my name is Fabian Palacios. I am a Mexican filmmaker uh, based in New York. And uh, yes, I my, my short film is a fiction piece. It's a coming of age story um, about a teenage guy who has a frustrated passion for music. And um, the story follows what happens if you try to follow your dreams, what happens if you do it the wrong way face the consequences of your actions. And um, yeah, basically um, it revolves a, a lot around music, which we won't be able to hear. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, it was a very passionate project uh, that I shot in my hometown, Mexico City. So oh. yeah. I, I wanna hear more about how the first couple of screenings went in your hometown as well. So we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to you. And then finally, Benjamin, writer, producer, um, tell us a little bit more about your project and uh, yeah, it tells more about your project. Hi, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm writer and producer of the <laughs> uh, film Perfection. And um, it tells the story of, uh, an, it's in a near future scenario uh, and our characters are uh, a mother and her daughter. The mother is suffering from some PTSD related um, psychological issues and uh, explores a um, sort of AI centered uh, resolution to those um, issues. And this, the, the short film uh, investigates the repercussions on her life and uh, also her daughter's life, uh, the relationship they have. And um, we filmed it in London during lockdown. So that was an interesting experience. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's been, I'm really happy that it's, it's uh, been selected for the member's choice. So thanks to everybody. All right, thank you. Well, we're gonna delve into all of your projects, but we're first of all gonna start with Vanessa. So I'm gonna get that program this side. So everyone who's watching will be able to see this film as we talk about it. 
Uh, so I'll do that now. But as we get this started, Vanessa, why don't we start by exploring a little bit more about why you wanted to make this documentary and what was the, the main force behind making it? Well, um, I guess I've been um, thinking about this problem or the issue of uh, the, well, the, the problem of dying colonies of bees and uh, other insects since I think 2017. And it started with pictures. I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, there are a lot of pictures um, of people on trees, on uh, I think fruit trees, like apple and pear trees in south of China and trying to pollinate them by hand. And these were um, pictures that actually shocked me when I saw it. And I thought it was, at first I, I thought it was a joke, but then I started um, doing more research on it and found out that actually in parts of China, people have to pollinate by hand because there are no insects and no bees, wild bees especially, uh, living there anymore. And it's very expensive and it's very hard to pollinate by hand um, especially for yeah. the people and they have to send little children onto these trees and we did more research on this and saw that we have collapsing colonies of uh, bees in the states since i think the early 2000s and um, we uh, just found that we had to do a movie on this problem but we didn't want to do it on the um, emphasizing the the problem we wanted to emphasize the solution so we looked at people especially young people that are very engaged, that are very passionate about doing something for wild bees, bees and the arts in general, and um, trying to um, give solutions that we as normal people can act out in everyday life and make it easy for us to access it. Because most of the movies that we know now, I think, um, that are talking about climate change and all the problems involved are leave me especially very sad and negative and also helpless and sometimes you know you want to do something you don't know what yeah mm -hmm. you you know the issue but there's nothing you you think actually you can do and so we wanted to produce a movie um where you go out of the movie and you feel like oh this is what i can do and that's what i will contribute amazing i think you've done an excellent job of it so really really Thank well you. done um Obviously, from watching the film, you're in it yourself as well. You're presenting, um, especially in the opening scenes yourself. Um, how did you find the people that you wanted to interview? You said that you wanted to talk to younger um, people who are passionate about this as well. So how did you go about finding your different subjects? I have to say, um, sometimes you can research really well and you find good things, but you have to have luck. Yeah. And in this case, it was actually... Um, two friends that that gave this contact uh, to me with the two young guys that are in the movie. So one is actually the son of a friend that I knew from a skate park in oh, when wow. I was 17. So <laughs> it's a long time ago that I met the parents. And they have done a perfect job raising three great children. And one of them is uh, a star in my in my documentary. And he came very late in the project. And this is, I think, the beauty of documentary, that you can plan something, yeah. but there is chance. And you have to, to, you have to improvise. And sometimes you have to leave space for um, some new projects and people to come in. And um, he came in, and I'm so glad uh, that he, he made it into the movie, that we had enough money and space and time to do it, because he actually is... Um, he is exactly the kind of person that represents um, what we need. We need engaged people that that want to do something, not from your head, but from your heart. And that's what he does. And obviously, the other people do it too. But that's what I meant to say. It's like sometimes chance comes and and uh, gives you a new topic. And this is what happened. Yeah, no, I, I think it's great. And and what you said about having, you have a structure. And you know exactly what you want to do with your documentary, but you are always going to be blown away by what actually comes on that journey. So I'm really happy that you managed to find a way to include uh, these lovely boys as well. Um, talking about hurdles and talking, well, I was talking about hurdles before we went live, talking about the whole process of the filmmaking and with the documentaries and with the short films that we're going to see here today as well. 
there must have been several hurdles that you had to overcome in order to get the project to what we're seeing here on screen today. What were some of the main things that you had to overcome? Oh, um, I don't know how about your project, but we started so long ago that the first first hurdle we had was the pandemic. <laughs> we <Yep>. started <laughs> um, and we wanted to do a project um, that was not funded. We didn't have sponsors in the beginning. We only won a prize by the Deutsche Bahn. That was the first prize. Uh, like it was an environmental prize um, that gave us the chance to start um, the movie. But after that, I mean, this is not a lot of money we got in the beginning. We needed more, and you couldn't find anyone. So the pandemic was actually the biggest problem for us as filmmakers because you couldn't reach anyone. Everyone was gone in, yeah. in the home office, and emails were postponed for months. And uh, that we had a lockdown. <laughs> so we did all our research, all our finding also of the protagonists in the lockdown and in the times where it was very difficult to find funding. And um, so we did it by crowdfunding and by uh, a, a great newspaper in Germany, the Süddeutsche Zeitung, that did a huge article on us. And we had private people putting money into the movie. And I think that to all filmmakers out there is the beauty when you see that even before you have a project coming out, people see and feel the idea that you have and join in and help you. And no, a crowdfunding doing a movie at the same time is actually the most crazy thing you can do. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. it's also, it is also so beautiful when you have a team supporting you, which I had, and uh, that um, makes it possible for you to yeah to get a dream onto the road that was actually just up in the air yeah funding and oh, funding is the hardest thing and with a producer here in the chat as well i'm sure funding is also mm -hmm. extremely hard for you and like people come to you all the time asking how do i fund my project how do i do this how do i do that so it's very interesting to hear that you went through multiple different ways so you started with a, a film fund for, what was the sorry what was the fund the it was an environmental prize by the Deutsche Bahn, the S Bahn oh, nice. Munich. So that's a suburban, uh, suburban uh, train that we have in Munich, and they gave us the first prize, which was their environmental prize. Perfect. And we had to, yeah. And th this is this was shortly before the pandemic, and then the uh, Corona came, and we we're like, okay, so what now? <laughs> yeah. And then you went through crowdfunding, which is another we went another route. Crowdfunding, and we also found other sponsors, mm -hmm. but it was just I meant to say it was just a long way, and uh, in believing, yeah, in believing that um, every day you will have to find the way through this by just going, just keep on going. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the film is finished, and you take it on the festival circuit. Did you manage to leave? a small budget to take the film on the festival circuit or did you have to refund um to put the film out there uh we have we had very little money left yes yep. uh, to start um for the first uh, festivals but now we need to look for a new sponsor so we can actually do the circus um because everything went into the production and the post-production of the movie and obviously when you are such a small uh, team and doing a huge project there are technical problems problems that you're facing and that cost a lot of money on the go so um yeah we are now looking for a new sponsor so hope soon we will find another chaperone who will you know tuck in and help us amazing i think this film will do incredibly well on the circuit and i've seen that you've already been at a few so if you're at the real beginning stages and you've had this much success so far it just means that there is a place for this film and the need for this film which is very exciting um, yeah, I hope so. I do I do think so. And, and that leads on to my next question. I wasn't sure where you were on the festival circuit, if you were starting or in the middle or mm. finishing. Are you in the process of looking for distributors right now? Or do you already also, have a distributor attached? No, we don't. Because the problem was when we started looking for distributors, um, the answer we got was that we had they had so many films during the pandemic waiting and the cinema is not sure, you know, what's going to happen this last year and this year that um, they were hesitant taking on a, a new project while there were so many piled up. So I hope that this year um, we will find a distributor um, soon that will help us. But first we have to also go into the circuit. And I'm really excited because this is 
a movie that was produced from the heart to the heart, <laughs> and I think you can feel it. This is this is at least what I, I I sense from people that they can feel how much passion is in this movie, not only by the filmmakers who are in the scene, the small tiny team that made it happen, but also the people, you know in front of the camera that did everything to make this uh, make their stories look great. So with all of that in mind, and we, sto- we spoke about hurdles that you had to overcome, um, what is the most proudest moment that you had either during the shoot or once the film was completed? What was the most proudest part that you had? Um, it's really interesting. It's a very interesting question. I think the proudest part is when... Um, we were in the movie, making the movie, and I was directing it and also in front of the camera. And I was basically in, a, in some kind of, you know, when you're in a washing machine. So you, you don't even know what day it is or how many hours you slept. Mm-hmm. And um, we didn't have enough money to get this movie to the end. And we never knew how many days we could actually make it. In the beginning, we thought it would be 20 minutes long or 30 minutes then 60 minutes and by every week we got more money, we knew we could make more, but it was it was going along this way. And one day my, pro- my co-producer, Yvonne, called me and said, Vanessa, have you checked your bank account? I'm like, <laughs> no. And she's like, someone just gave us a huge amount of money in one night just because of um, watching or seeing this article and he'd put it into the crowdfunding and we were just amazed that that's you know that can happen and this is so beautiful because the movie wasn't even done we don't even know this person yeah we can only thank him or her we think it's him um that he did that but he never called us he never wanted anything and it was a very beautiful moment to have such a voice, someone who doesn't know you, who doesn't know the project and just believes in what he reads and what he sees and what he hopes for. And this kind of trust was mind blowing to me. Amazing. So we are coming to the end of, of your section, but there's just a couple more questions I wanted to ask. And I think what you've just mentioned is a really nice way to start ending, ending this, this chat. But I want to turn the question more to you. And I want to find out what inspired you to get into this crazy industry of filmmaking. Was there a particular moment when you were growing up, going to the cinema, a particular film? Or have you always known Mm -hmm. that this was your industry? No. um, When I was eight years old, um, I read uh, The Never Ending Story by Michael (laughs) Ende. And I decided back then that I wanted to be the unendliche Kaiserin, uh, the kindliche Kaiserin. I don't know what it is in English. The uh, Mountain Kind. Um, I don't know the, the, the name in English because I only read it in German. So um, I actually wrote a letter to the author, Michael Ende, and said, please, I want to be you. When you, when you film this movie, I want to be your, your star of this, uh, <laughs> of this, of this protagonist, uh, the, kindliche, the Kindliche Kaiserin. And he uh, wrote me back and said, well, I'm sorry, this movie had, has already been sold. The story has been sold. I can't, you know, I have no saying in the cast, but I wish you good luck in the film industry and uh, I'm sure you'll make your way. And um, it was this letter that actually um, pushed me. My To get a letter from someone that you have in- yeah. that inspired you so much and he has so much fantasy and uh, everything that uh, I think is beautiful is in this story. The Unendliche Geschichte, The Never End Story, it's a really great book. Amazing. What a fun and interesting story. I hope you framed that letter mm-hmm. or have it safe anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. For our other filmmakers on the call, do you have any Thank questions you. for Vanessa? Or any thoughts that you'd want to share listening to her story? Yeah, so how, how long did it take you actually to finish the film? You were saying you started before the pandemic, then kind of slowed down during the lockdown and then finally you were able to finish it so mm. how long was the process for you to finish the whole the whole project itself it's actually um i would have to ask my uh, co-producer yvonne but i think um mm. if she doesn't if she doesn't raise her hand now it was 18 months from the big from from start till end so i think we started in october 2020 2019 2020 no 2020 and we finished in um, 
filming in, I think, in August 21. And then post-production was done in uh, May 2022. So all together, I think it was 18 months mm. from getting the first money to um, having a release or a done film, which I now learn later that is really quick. And this is something I'm, I have two girls and I didn't know uh, in the beginning uh, what it would be to how, what it would mean to be a mother but it's a bit like that yeah you just decide you do something and uh, later on you find out that it's actually <laughs> a crazy thing you were doing <laughs> but um yeah I had a great team and so um it's all about teamwork it's all about who supports you who's behind you I had family supporting me I had this team supporting me until now until the end and so we were very fast and um but this movie and this topic had to be fast. It, there was no time to postpone something like that. Yeah, no, I agree. Thank you. Um, we are going to move over to your film, Fabian. So uh, as I get that loaded, why don't you reintroduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about the inspiration behind this project? Yeah. So hello, everyone, everyone who's watching. Um, my name is uh, Fabian Palacios. And uh, yeah, I'm a Mexican filmmaker. I'm actually just starting and stepping onto, you know, professional career, or that's what I would wish to do. And uh, yes, I'm, I'm going to talk, and you're going to see a little bit about azar. It's um, which stands for chance uh, in English, but I like the, the title in Spanish, and, and I said it, it has to stay. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's just uh, just listening to Vanessa talk. Like um, I agree a lot, and uh, about what she said with the teamwork, the process, and uh, with this project in particular, um, it was um, yeah, it's, it's a fiction, and I wanted to explore uh, writing a short film that explores dream, feels a little surreal. Wanted to try out black and white, and um, and yeah, you know, having a little break from everything you know, too dense, too intense that's going on in the world. And, you know, trying to remind ourselves why we fall in love with art, with music, with cinema. And um, again, I was um, lucky enough to, to follow um, this path and to find myself with a beautiful team, beautiful people, talented um, crew members, cinematographer, producers. They're amazing. I love them. Uh, they believed in the, in the vision of the film. And I believe um, that's what stays in, in the film. And, and maybe you can, you can, we can transmit that um, as you watch the film, the, the passion and the love Absolutely. for the actual uh, film. Absolutely. So, I, I agree 100% with everything you've just said. Can I just remind everyone on the call to have their uh, microphones muted because there's a bit of feedback coming back. I think it's, thanks Mo. I think it was yours. Uh, sorry about that. Um, can I, we talk a little bit about your casting? Yes. Because they are absolutely phenomenal. Each and every single one of your actors are fantastic. So how did you go about casting your performers or finding them? So um, I had um, a casting director help me out. Um, you know, we had a long talk, a talk. I described how I imagine every single one of the characters. He was sending me ideas. Um, people, resumes, um, tapes, et cetera. And I selected the ones I wanted to meet in person because I didn't want to do it through Zoom. It was a possibility, it was locked down as well. Mm -hmm. But I said, let's try to keep it minimal, but regardless, I do want to meet this, um, uh, the people I'm going to be working with. So uh, we made a few selection, had a small um, audition going on, casting, and what I like to do more than, you know, practicing the scene or, or anything, I, I wanted to get to know them, to talk to them, to see if they had what I was looking for. Basically trying to find the character already within the person rather than Great. having them transform into it. So I was lucky enough to almost find every single one of the, of the, of the cast in the, okay. during this audition. And the funny part is that actually the main character, who is Julian, uh, his name is uh, Angel Cortez. He is the brother of the cinematographer of the film. Oh, cool. And it wasn't until, you know, a couple of weeks before we shot 
that he reminded me or he said to me like you know what i have a brother who is an actor who is around the age that you're looking for i told him like why didn't you tell me before uh, <laughs> yeah. you know we're we're struggling to find the lead character and he told he sent me pictures of him i love the way you know his facebook the eyes and everything and he asked me do you want me to audition him i was like yeah please please do so he auditioned him uh, he read a, a part uh, some pages of the script and i loved it i was like yeah it's beautiful you know let's let's have it on so I was lucky enough to be working with both brothers, you know, uh, Alejandro, who is the, the cinematographer, who is incredibly talented, and his brother, you know, um, who is the main actor. Amazing. So, yeah. And because their chemistry is so well across, like, all of the actors, did you do quite an intensive rehearsal period with them, or was it more turn up on set, we'll go through it a few times, and then we're going to shoot? No, I did actually wanted to rehearse with them before, so we did two rehearsals. The first one was just to break the eyes, get them to know each other, because I was trying to create this chemistry that you talked about between them, you know? So I was like, don't be afraid, you know, touch each other, like push each other. You're supposed to be friends uh, from childhood. So you basically have no respect <laughs> to each other, so to speak. So we did some exercises, physical exercises, games, you know, in a park just to you know have them to get to know each other and actually for the the whole scene in the street um which is a, a sequence we did rehearse that so um i told them you know by that tree by that lamp you're gonna jump you're gonna you know follow you're gonna stay behind you're gonna turn around and i remember i told them that's the only thing that i don't want to see as you guys walk is yeah. you can't be on a straight line because that's just too boring I needed to be a little more dynamic and I was so grateful that we did that rehearsal because uh, in the actual day of the shoot, you know, it's it's a central park in, 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 in Mexico. So it's crazy with a lot of people and it would have been a mess, would have lost a lot of time. So luckily we did rehearse and block that scene completely. Great. Great. Uh, Mo, did you have a question at all? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, could you mute your microphone? Because it keeps um, having a bit of feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so you talked about the cinematographer. Uh, and one of my questions is about shooting. I don't know if you, sh well, it's black and white. What was the decision to go black and white? Well, for some reason, since I was living in, in or I'm, I'm living in New York, I, I was thinking back of my hometown, you know, a little bit more nostalgic. Mm. And I've been, I, I was watching a lot of black and white films and uh, I don't know, I, I find it more compelling and, you know, the contrast makes the story a little bit more drastic and it always adds a little bit more drama. So I wanted to explore um, that world, not trying to focus too much on the color palette and try to, you know, push um, the black and white as much as I can. And in a sense, try to make it timeless because I remember that's a question people ask ask me like since there's no phones no technology in the film people ask me like is this said what in the 90s or 80s sure. 2000s i was like that's I, I guess that's what i was trying to get at it's a story that could take place anywhere and at any time so i just chose and decided to you know place it in mexico city but i do believe the story is very universal and maybe having the black and white adds a little bit more to that. Great, fantastic. Another thing I wanted to talk about was the music, but we can't hear it if you're watching this. Um, there's quite a few people watching, so if you do have any questions for any of our filmmakers, this is just a reminder that you can add um, some questions in the chat room. But I wanted to talk about music because throughout the film, the score is just beautiful. Who was your composer? Did you work with a new artist or a friend or how did you get this soundtrack? Yes, that was quite um, a journey to find. So I ended up working with a composer. His name is Richard Titon, or Titone. And uh, he's a great musician. You know, he has worked with the Philharmonic in New York. Wow. And uh, he's a classical composer. So I had to go back and ask uh, some of the teachers I had in college um, if they knew anyone uh, who was a composer, especially a trumpeter, because um, that was, you know, looking for one for the film and one of my uh, old teachers directed me to him I sent him an email we had a phone call 
I sent them the script and he told me that he identified himself as Don Julian, uh, one of the characters who plays the trumpet in the, in, in the movie. So he said like, oh, your character is supposed to be around 70. I'm 70. I play the trumpet. He plays the trumpet. So uh, it worked out well as he read the script. He got excited. Um, I sent him some references of the music that I, that I was trying to get at, uh, which is heavily inspired by um, uh, uh, the most famous trumpeter in Mexico. His name is Rafael Mendes, who is basically a virtuoso of the, of, of, of the trumpet. And I was trying to lean a little bit more towards classical music with a trumpet to contrast it with the, you know, the street. Having a teenager listen to um, classical music is quite strange or bizarre. So I wanted to have that contrast um, to add something special to 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 the film. And I do believe Richard did a fantastic job. I love the score. It's beautiful. Absolutely. There's just a question that's come in in the chat room uh, for you yeah. from Bernardo. He says, where do you take inspiration from? We've kind of spoken about that, but if you can just quickly sure. fill Bernardo in, that'd be great. Yeah, so those were um, two stories that I put together. One that happened um, to me while I was in Mexico in Coyacan, the neighborhood where um, the film takes place. I was uh, having uh, breakfast at a restaurant, you know, open, and I just hear a trumpet coming from the distance in the street. I tried to look what it was, and uh, nobody seemed to care around the restaurant, as, and, and the trumpet and the music was getting louder and louder and louder. And all of a sudden, an old man, an old trumpeter, shows up. He was practicing, talk, uh, playing the, the trumpet. He wasn't asking for money. So I was thinking, is he rehearsing? Is he asking for money? Is he going to a concert, coming from a concert? And just as he took the music with him, uh, he took it back away, you know, and he just walked off and walked away. And it felt like a very surreal um, moment to me. So I loved that and it felt like only I watched it, everyone was like stuck to their phones. Yeah. So that scene like really stuck in my head. And then the other part of the story is that um, I was staying at a friend's house where I actually ended up shooting the film, the house. So we went upstairs to, to, um, to the attic to look for something and he found his old trombone who he, that he hadn't played in years. So he took it out, we were in the, in the roof and he started making some horrible, horrible noises with a trombone and I thought it was hilarious. And somehow I connected those stories and came up with it. So. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. We are coming to the end of, of your little section as well. So I just want to um, ask you a few final questions. What is next for this project? Is it currently coming to the end of the festival circuit or what? Yeah. What is next for the project? Well, actually, I'm just starting the, uh, the festival circuit. So Perfect. I want to see how, yeah, how well it does, you know, um, I know since it's a it's a fiction, it's it's a little harder for it to get the attention of many people because, um, yeah, you know, right now there are a lot of uh, themes or subjects that I look for in specific festivals, but I do believe for, for those who, you know, want to take a little break and enjoy, um, yeah, a little coming of age story should 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 do well, should do fine. I, hope. I think it will do. I think it will do well as well um and then what is next for you um i'm trying to make the next one actually the next short film to be shot in new york city uh, i still am in the writing process so nothing's concrete uh, at the moment but uh yeah trying to make a couple more short films to prepare myself eventually to jump into features because that's the goal where i would like to Amazing. end and then my so, final, sorry, yeah. sorry, I cut you off there. No, 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 yeah, no, no, no. Okay. And then my final question is the same that we ended with Vanessa with, why did you want to get into this industry? Was there a film, a moment, or what inspired you? Well, I was always a, a fanatic of music, actually. Mm. So everyone thought that I was going to be a musician. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I always found myself very distracted by everything, creating like little scenes scenarios in my head um you know and um at some point i thought you know what might as well do something with that you know since you're always always imagining stuff or little stories in your head and um so i was lucky enough to try this path 
uh, also a big influence for me was my best friend, um, who is also a filmmaker. His, uh, his dad is a film director, so I got to do an internship at his production company back in Mexico to see how this world works and everything. And uh, yeah, I loved it. I, I, I found it very amusing, very exciting, and I decided to give it a go. Amazing. You took, you took the jump took the jump I, I into the madness the so yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic thank you so much for sharing uh, your thank film you. as we move on to the next one i just want to ask the other filmmakers do you have any questions for fabian i i had one question if i may y yeah uh, um, yeah it's just uh, you know it's so interesting that you're um working both in Mexico and New York and uh, or Mexico City and New York and I wonder if you know you're crossing borders well how would you say your crossing borders informs your creative work well actually that was one of the biggest struggles that I had because since I didn't know anybody back in Mexico I was very scared and um, you know I even thought this project is not going to be made but I was lucky enough to find, you know, um, again, a beautiful crew and people who were uh, willing to help and um, and participate in, in the vision of the, of the of the project. And then again, you know, trying to get the both uh, the you know the best out of both cities. You know, I met Alejandro. Who, funny enough, he's also Mexican, but I met him in New York, so I took him with me to Mexico City. And then the producer is Mexican, and um, you know it was almost like a collaboration between New York and Mexico, and trying to, you know, whatever I had in New York, bring it to Mexico, and whatever I have in Mexico, use it there or bring it back to, to New York. Um, so there isn't really like a, a specific way to do it, uh, or like a manual or instruction. You just evolve and learn as you go. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely scary, but exciting at the same time. So um, I was lucky enough to have those both um, opportunities or places to, to take the best out of. Also, oh yeah, a lot of financing actually came from New York. Uh, you mm. know, I applied for many scholarships and all that. So I was basically taking the funding from New York and use it in Mexico, which it's basically doubling it. <laughs> You know, so um, so yeah, that was that was also very a very uh, good way for, for for making the project. Fantastic! There's a lot of love for you in the chat room right now, <laughs> so that's fantastic. Probably my friends. Yeah, Thank but you. that's great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna move on to Mo your project now. So I'm just gonna get that started. This one is a lot shorter than the other films. It's a music video. So we'll play the music video and talk over it and then we'll come back to the bigger screen. So Mo, yep, you've unmuted yourself. Perfect. Let's get your film started. Why don't you tell us, it's already starting my side. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself as a filmmaker and your background into why you wanted to make this series of Download My Heart. Oh, Mo, you're, you're muted now. There you go. Um. I started as an inventor. I have nine American patents in video on demand and satellite technology. I licensed Apple Corporation, AT&T, Verizon, Echostar, and so on. And then fast forward to my, in, so I cr contributed technology to the digital era. And then I decided after the, my patents expired to contribute um, culture to the, to, the, to the digital era. So I started out by writing and producing songs. Um, which uh, one of them was hashtag queens, um, which I then had to support with a, um, a comic book and then a hashtag queen throne, which got noticed by Facebook and Twitter. And then I collaborated with Facebook uh, for a Facebook throne, um, which was in Facebook headquarters in, uh, in 10 Brock Street in London. And then uh, also with Twitter in 2019 and 2018 with, uh, with Twitter. Uh, at their headquarters uh, as well. So um, I then, you know, uh, 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 because uh, Universal Music is distributing my music via, via Apple, Amazon, Spotify, and so on, uh, I, um, I created the world's first uh, app songs, uh, app song series, uh, Download My Heart in, in London, uh, which, was picked up, which was approved by Mayor Sadiq Khan for 
use in uh, post metaver post uh, COVID uh, uh, tourist uh, promotion and business promotion. And um, and then on your show, where you said, "What are you going to do next?" When we interviewed me, and I said, "Well, I was going to do LA, but then I'll, I really will do uh, metaverse next." So we did the metaverse, and it's uh, download my heart in the metaverse, which is a tour of um, where since we are so so uh, so phone obsessed, and we are our our robots, which are the phones, but it's also you know um, a kind of uh, um, overview of what we are doing in our lives that um, um, I decided to make download my write download my heart in the metaverse and we've got 60 plus awards so far from all over the world um, and uh, it's a tour of uh, the next chapter of our lives um, in the form of um, you know our the par our parallel universe um, and um, it's a baby step, uh, but I, we, uh, since uh, uh, since hashtag Queens also has developed into a GIF series, which has had half a billion views on wow. Jiffy.com and about nothing less than half a million a day to a million a day uh, worldwide. Uh, so it's evolved into a into a game character called Shio hashtag Queen Superhero, who's a cross between James Bond, your 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 film studios, yeah, <laughs> and, and Tarzan. Um, but she's the first character who, I mean, she comes from the new world, from the new world uh, to our digital era, rather from the rather than most game characters come from the old world and dress up in the new world. So she doesn't kill her opponents. She she disables her with her Tesla electromagnetic guns to interrogate them to get to the higher ups uh, to knock out uh, gangsters and gangs in <laughs> in, in Great. cities. Um, so she's a and so she's a. A, a, a novel, and then she sings in real life for real, since her song is distributed by Universal Music worldwide, Shio um, and Hashtag Queen. So she raises consciousness and support for her with the public, with the real, with the public to for her in-game fights against gangs. So she's a she straddles both worlds. Uh, so she's out now on Google Play, um, and uh, the nice thing is that on Google Play you can. You can it drills down the data analytics to know who is playing at any one time, how many times, what they're doing and what they're not doing. So you're you're deep into the metaverse in in for real. Um, so um, it's it's uh, it's fun and um, it's you know games are the, the the first level of entry into the metaverse. Um, and now with AI, um, AI has taken over the tempo and the control of the tempo, not us. Um, so who knows how fast we're going to go into it and who knows what's going to happen, um, even in the next two or three years, because a professor, you know, on, on CNN was being interviewed who had written a textbook for artificial intelligence for 130, used by 130 countries. Uh, he's a professor at a major in American university. They asked him, what do you, what, what do you think AI is thinking for itself? He said, we have no way of knowing and we, we do not know what it is planning within itself other than the plans we have for it mm. wow that was a lot of stuff that you you spoke about there and i kind of want to break down quite a bit of it moving forward um but i think you're in the future of what what is happening when we first interviewed you last year the metaverse was extremely new and it had literally just launched there are now radio adverts in the uk introducing the power of the metaverse and they were talking about how kids can go to schools who couldn't physically get there or how firefighters could remap a building to get people out in the safest quickest way and i just think it's really interesting that you were the first in there to do a music video and to see this technology and believe in the technology when i think there's a lot of people that are not against it but reluctant to accept this new technology because of the way it's advancing so fast so i think it's very brave of you to jump into that into that world well, it's, i'm really depicting uh the reality we live in which we may not notice or appreciate if we spend so much time on the phone and the phone is grading us on how much screen time <laughs> this is true. we have with it uh and a guy just committed suicide 10 days ago because ai rejected him um you know we are deep into 
into this metaverse already. So why not, uh, you know, it's an extension of ourselves. So why not get with it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in our case, you know, uh, a very danceable music at that. So the film has done, or the music video has done extremely well on the festival circuit. What did you say? Over over 64 awards? Over 60 or 65 awards worldwide. Uh, And um, uh, Twitter reached out to me to collaborate a second time with them. And so they have my artwork, my electro artwork in their client's lounge on 10 Air Air Street, uh, 20 Air Street, which is download my heart uh, in London at Twitter, so it's 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 a Twitter bird and the the, the, the globe uh, and even Elon Musk's rocket going to Mars. It's all it's all it's a it's a it's a very slow moving art piece within a, a screen, which is exactly we are all screen based, and so you know uh, the new canvas are screens wherever yeah. you look at screens. Um, so uh, it's it's there now. So they you know it's. For, for people to appreciate when they visit Twitter headquarters in London. And as you as a filmmaker, you spoke about um, taking this project, making it into a video game and, and the rom-com yeah. uh, and, and t- stuff uh, like taking that. Taking a few from your recommendation, you say, why don't you go to, when we did the first the first one, Download My Heart in London, you said, take it to countries and talk to them about, uh, you know, collaborating with them for their city. So we, you know, uh, we took that, uh, uh, to heart, and we want to develop "Download My Heart" as a as a "Download My Heart" in whatever city uh, could be in your case, Munich, for example. Uh, with together with uh, uh, or in Mexico City, together with the city uh, the city authorities who want to promote the city, and they will help you develop your you know I mean help you with your production budget for doing the 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 the, the, the uh, you know the reality TV series, absolutely. Uh, as well yeah. as well as a romantic comedy film, Download My Heart. It's a no-brainer. Uh, it would, you know, even if the production is, you know, not that uh, expensive or the acting, people would want to see it because it's so it's so res- it so resonates with who we are today. We Download My Heart is uh, modern speak. Why I love you. So everything sounds very positive with what you're saying, but there is a lot of work that you've put into this. So I'd like to understand what was the main hurdle that you had to overcome in order to get this series out there, have such huge success in the festival circuit. But there must have been some hurdles in your place um, on on this journey. So what's one that sticks in mind for you? Well, the festival is zero. (laughs) That's uh, the first? (laughs) I mean, it makes them look good because they are more they become more relevant to their audiences they're all they're all they're fighting against other film festivals uh, for audience share so it makes them look good because it's it's something that they have on the menu which they normally would not um, fair enough so, you but know, um, if we take it no back one, no one else has done this if we take it back to production new. then ah, well, that's a different story. yeah um, how how to get uh, how, how do you tell this story cinematically, uh, wh- which is already th- the future? So, uh, I mean, how, wh- where, do you, where are you going to get this? Uh, so we took parts of it from, the, from, from our video game development uh, and parts of it from, uh, you know, uh, scenes that we shot for, for the hashtag Queens uh, uh, music videos and, and the fashions uh, associated with it and combined it with... Uh, with or existing footage and then uh, uh, altered footage that to 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 resonate with with what with the with the lyrics um, uh, in, in 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 sync. So it, it's a you know it was a, a modification of 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 our own generated uh, videos as well as you know uh, videos that we got from from others uh, to to make this to make the storytelling work in 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 cinematic format. Amazing. Um, we, you, you spoke, of, I'm, I'm just jumping around a bit. It's something just popped into my mind and is, I'm just gonna suggest it. But when you were talking about, or when we were talking about potentially collaborating with different embassies in order to help promote tourism in different countries or reaching out to the, the foreign office of tourism to collaborate, have you thought about doing that within the metaverse as well? Considering now you have the platform of a tour of the metaverse, could you not do a tour of that country within 
the metaverse oh, who, highlight. Who is the mayor? Who is the mayor of the metaverse? <laughs> Please give me his address or her address. I don't know, we'll but I guess if you them. if you reach out to to the embassy or the foreign office and say this is what we want to do to highlight tourism, people can come and visit your uh, town or country from the comfort of their own sofa before they come. I don't yeah, know. This is just an idea that's like spilling out, but it's not. We took your advice to heart and went to the mayor of London. Um, and he, he accepted it right away because he loved the, the music video. Uh, and he, he wanted that added to his, to his uh, cam campaigns, his uh, tourism promotion campaign. So could you add the dimension of the metaverse into this? Uh, Most uh, likely, to, I think. To, to, to empower it. Absolutely. You have a good point in there. As you can, you can bring two dimensions, uh, the, the physical dimension and, uh, and the metaverse dimension um, to, in, to play. I think that you've got lots of possibilities ahead of you. Before we move on to the final film, our filmmakers on the call, do you have any questions for Mo? Yep, go for it, Vanessa. I would like to know, I mean, I know so little about the metaverse, but I would like to know what your personal experience is with the metaverse. Why did you pick this topic? I mean, if you were 11 or 12, maybe I, you know, that's something I think that the, the very young ones are very familiar with the metaverse or maybe also 14, 15 or 20. But for my generation and my friends, we are not, I don't know, I have, I, I never encounter the metaverse in any uh, experience I have. So I wonder what's your personal experience well, with the metaverse? Because it's, it's going to be, it's, it's, an, ex, it's an extension of, uh, you know, of our phones. Uh, so it's, it's, it's such a dominant part of our lives that it's there so that you better, you know, I want to, to and I'm comfortable with living on the frontier and, 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 and exploring the future. So that's that's what I'm interested in, and that's an a that's a those are the, the dynamics of what's in here, right? And and how it can help you. You do everything with that. I mean, you don't go to the bank anymore. You don't go to the supermarket anymore. You don't go to the store anymore. Uh, you know, everything comes to you via this, right? So you are already empowered by this, and the next phase of this is to take you. And, and go into the grocery store and take you and go into the movie and take you into the into the clothing store and so on. So that's that's it. We, we're, we're at that uh, at threshold right now. Um, AI is going to super speed all this uh, and push us into it, uh, whether we like it or not. So that's why I'm exploring, even though it's not, you know, uh, tangible and you can't uh, put your, your finger on it. But you actually are because you have your fingers wrapped around your phone, even when on, under your, uh, in your hand under your pillow. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, right. I you think. Know, how, how much more intimate can it be? <laughs> I understand where you're coming from, Vanessa, because I'm also of that stage where I'm not ever. I don't even. I have a little bit of AI interest, but for the metaverse and stuff like that, it's it's just not in our conversation as friends or mm. in in my world. But I do yeah. think, as Mo's saying, he's a fr he's at the frontier. But it, I think it's going to seep into our lives, whether we like it or not, in several different forms. And why not why not try and be one of the first to do something? So I understand both of the arguments there. Perfect. Uh, any other questions before we move on to the final to the final project? Nope. In that case, thank you, Mo. And Ben, why don't you kick us off by reintroducing yourself and telling us a little bit more about the inspiration of this piece? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Ben, and I wrote the script for Perfection, um, which was directed by Robin Fraser. And um, the inspiration came from partly my personal interests and partly uh, conversations I had when I was living in Australia um, several years ago uh, with, with a, a good friend who is uh, well-versed on um, AI technology questions. And, <laughs> uh, and in fact, perhaps similar field to the one that Mohammed has been talking about. Um, and I wanted to uh, explore the human um, facet of of, of this world and uh, I wanted I was particularly interested in the possibilities the sort of filmic and storytelling possibilities of a short film set in the near future so um, it was without the 
some of the sort of budgetary and um, logistical problems of setting a story in the in the far future, but one that is really recognizable um, and yet has these slightly uncanny, unsettling elements of the uh, you know te technological revolution. Um, uh, but but the most important to me was to explore uh, a, a human relationship in this context. Fantastic. Um, I have several questions that I have lined up. I want to talk about. Um, I was I was reading um, some of the judges' reviews on this film before we jumped on the call today, and several judges' first comment was, "Amazing lead performances, strong casting." Um, what was the casting process for this? Because they're so unbelievably believable. Um, so tell us if you, if you have the knowledge of this side of it as well, please tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I was lucky to be a part of the whole casting process from the beginning. Um, and we, I mean, we, I think we, you know, we went through the casting, um, uh, process in a relatively traditional way. We didn't have a, a casting agent or anything like that, but, um, we otherwise went through the traditional routes, um, and we were incredibly lucky to find uh, Ellie and Rudy, who were the main the lead roles. Um, Ellie, in particular, who played Alex, the mother, is is a very experienced actor, um, and you know we knew that we had something good there, but then the actual performances and and, and what we ended up with just was far beyond you know our expectations and we uh i know that robin uh, the director um is so glad to have had the experience of working with such high quality and and especially uh, in ellie's case um experienced actors it's it's uh it was a real treat for us when you said the traditional roots are you talking about spotlight yeah, Spotlight was definitely a major resource for us in finding um, those uh, lead, those protagonists. Uh, I think uh, I think we actually found both uh, Rudy and Ellie via Spotlight. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you said traditional, it has to be Spotlight, otherwise, I'm not entirely sure yeah, what right. you're talking about. But yeah, perfect. Um, let's talk about locations. So where was this all shot? You mentioned in your intro at the beginning that it was shot in London, but I'm looking at the different, like the house, for example, whose property was this? Do you want to talk us about how you secured the locations? Yeah, the location was a really important thing for us because as I mentioned, we really needed to find something that was plausible, yeah. recognizable, had this, you know, uncanny future element. So um, again, Robin and I were, uh, this was, a time of lockdown so it was sometimes difficult but whenever we had the chance and it was you know it was legal to do so uh robin and i would be doing some location scouting around london and you know london um it, it is one of the cities where perhaps the uh the, there are a lot of stories are told in london but it's such a big city that you can find places and architectures within it that are still exciting and yeah Kind of blow your mind and so we were really lucky to find this place near king's cross um it's a residential complex and it just had exactly the right elements and we were really lucky to find somebody who lived there who was happy to let us use his flat um he vacated it he let us use it he was really really nice wow <laughs> and he did it just kind of you know from i guess the goodness of his heart he was really interested in the story and wanted to play a part in it so I think that speaks for, you know, if you are approaching um, people in a kind of open and honest way um, and you can build up a good relationship, then you can get really far with locations I, and things. I think that's a rule in life, really. If, you, if you're happy to ask, the worst scenario is no. But you never know. Sure. A lot of the time people are way more open than you expect, so... I yeah, think that's a very good absolutely. point that you made there. So shooting outside in London, unless you're going guerrilla style, is not cheap. So did you go through the correct way and get licenses or did you just go for it? Um, in most of, most of the cases, we were kind of going for it, <laughs> yep. um, if, I, if I'm completely honest. Um, 
uh, again, I mean, Robin, the director, is uh, he's a master of you know making something look like it costs a lot, but actually doing it on a surprisingly small budget. And I think a lot of that is you know having the confidence to do something yourself um and just being yeah giving giving something a shot you might not think you've got the capabilities but you know if you think if you plan it carefully um then it can it can work out um so in some of the cases we were uh, operating in the city that was very very quiet because you know again owing to the time yeah not much was happening on the streets but the estate um, was, it's quiet most of the time anyway, so we were able to sort of shoot on, you know, c- kind of quite fast and quickly. Um, so how long was the shoot from start to finish? We had uh, five days. It was intended to be four. We had, we ended up doing five um, and it went pretty smoothly. Good, good. Um, so let's talk about music. Because there's a few, well, particularly one very famous song in this film. Yeah. How did you get the license for that? Or how much did you have so, to pay for that? Yeah. So that is, um, as far as I'm aware, I think Robin was more uh, on music than I was. Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, that's found music that, that Robin um, okay, cool. uh, was able to uh, get to use for the film. But um, I know from our conversations around that, that he just, you know, knew that it was, when he first heard it, he knew that it was perfect um, and carried the right atmosphere and, you know, did it, did everything that we, we needed it to do. Yeah, so, I, I also um, thought it was a perfect fit. As soon as it came on, I was just like, yeah, this is exactly what, what it, it was just great. And often when you're watching when you're planning a film yourself well for me anyway I listen to a lot of music and I'm just like oh, I wish I had the budget for that or I wish I could include that or or get the licenses for xyz because as soon as you add a song that's familiar to an audience they feel connected so I think it was a very clever clever move um oh I think Mo Mo's just jumped out the call um so yeah, I guess you spoke a little bit about hurdles, but I wanted to delve a bit deeper with that. Was there anything else that really was quite difficult that you had to overcome that isn't to do with COVID or the, the COVID times, but something else? Sure. I mean, speaking as a writer, I mean, you know, in all honesty, of course, the writing process can be arduous at times trying to, you know, I think deciding at which point the script is is ready to go. Of course, you have production pressures that shape that but um you know that was early on the moment of confidence thinking you know this is this is a story that we we can stick with and go with and uh, so there's that um i think actually i was really interested to see how the post-production process was you know sometimes very tricky i mean you know the edit was sometimes complicated um and particularly aspects of it involving um you know sort of uh, cgi or uh, we we had a we had a great guru dealing with all that but um the post-production process was certainly at times pretty grueling um just because there are so many moving parts there and for me that was a bit of a learning curve you know i wasn't trained in filmmaking so much I was trained in screenwriting but yeah. I'd recommend definitely to any screenwriters out there I very hardly recommend um, getting that experience on the filmmaking side because then you then you appreciate what directors are working <laughs> with them. absolutely um, so what's next for you have you got another script almost ready to go are you in the process of writing something new yeah, so I've, uh, since then, I mean, that's about two years ago that we okay. filmed, uh, not quite, but it feels like it. Um, for me, since then, I've been writing uh, feature films, uh, short films, and TV pilots. So, uh, been very you know, busy. working hard. Sorry? You've been very busy. Very busy. Um, and I um, certainly hope that... Um, Perfection is um, not only um, 
uh, a story worthy in its own right, but is something that you know um, propels propels my career in in, in, in writing. Um, I think certainly something that Robin and I uh, were excited about with Perfection was um, the possibilities for the story to expand outwards. So we knew that um, we were, you know, working with an interesting story that could be told in the 19 minutes that it is. But there's so much to unpack there that we have since then, you know, thought a lot about how could this be right for television, for example. Um, and uh, so that's something I give a lot of thought to. Okay, yeah. So are you going to use this as a proof of concept or expand this so it becomes the first pilot episode? Certainly, that's something I, I'm interested in doing. Yeah, I think, as I say, I think it's got so much sort of yeah, story yeah. and purpose that um, uh, I, I'm i thinking about how could this be a TV series? Yeah, so. Amazing. Uh, fun. I think um, in the meantime, as you are building towards that, there's a YouTube channel called Dusk. Do you know it, Dust? I don't know. Uh, it's sci fi only. And if you get your project on there, then it it literally elevates the project. It can get between hundreds of thousands of views, if not into the millions, if it connects with the right audience. And Dusk is just the perfect platform for sci-fi. Um, so I would look at reaching out to them and seeing once you finish the festival circuit and once you are building up your database and analytics to take to to some a funder for the feature or for whoever when you're pitching for the the tv series having those statistics along with the project where it's screened how yeah. well it's done on the festival circuit it's now on this youtube channel it's getting let's say a million views all of a sudden your project has an audience so mm -hmm. it, it's just a really great place to put a short depending on what you want to do with it in the future so it's just something to That's think fantastic. about yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. I think because of the sci-fi elements and, and the special effects, I think it will really fit well in there. But yeah. I cool. appreciate it. Um, and then you're a writer. How did you decide that this was the profession that you wanted to get into? Uh, so, I mean, that's a boring answer. I've <laughs> just written ever since I was like, you know, three. Uh, oh, well. I, I still have like, a detective story. I wrote my sister and it's like, on a couple of sheets of, it's, on, it's like a crayon on a bit of paper. Um, so I've, I've, I've been interested in telling stories since I was a kid. And um, uh, I, yeah, I, 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 do you know, one thing that really drew me into the world of screenwriting in particular was the collaborative process. Mm. Um, you know, I've also written, I mean, I also write prose, which is great. Um, and it has its own strengths, and I love books, but um, there's something really special about screenwriting where you are essentially forced to kind of put your mind together with other people and sometimes compromise. Uh, <laughs> um, sometimes, you know, not compromise, but um, the, in general, the experience of working with others to achieve a vision, I think is yeah it's really special and um so that that drew me in particular towards screenwriting fantastic thank you how may i ask something yes please or, please go I, for it i was going to ask you benjamin since you mentioned it how what's your process to collaboration like um do you do you like to sit in a room with you know one or two people and write together or just pass drafts back and forth and make corrections or is there something particular that really works for you? That's a great question. And I have to say that um, I've kind of, I think I've tried a, a few different options. Um, so I have tried the kind of um, passing backwards and forwards and um, kind of um, really, really sharing the story shaping responsibilities with a director, with directors, with other writers, um, more particularly with directors. Um, and that's why it's great. But I think actually I would say that the most successful um, methodology or kind of approach I've taken so far is um, a kind of co-co, it's like 
a very um a very intimate um and careful conception of the idea of it, the person you're making the film with so let's say the director um but then when it comes to the the, the writing of it then if you're on that project as the writer then i think there comes a point when you need to back yourself and say okay this is my job um mm. i'm gonna go and write the thing that we've talked about for ages and then hopefully you'll, you'll direct it you know of course there's going to be notes and everything and there's going to be lots of conversation and that's really important but i think there is i think it is important as as writers to say at some point let me go into the little hut and do my do my thing because this is what i'm good at um i think there is a point at which too many cooks can spoil the broth to use a tired cliche <laughs> yeah <laughs> i love that yeah. cliche um, yeah. Great. Any other questions before we finish up today's stream? No? Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for sharing all of your stories. And good luck with everything that you are doing. I'm just going to end the stream here, but do stay on. And, um, yeah, I'll speak to you in a second. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who was watching. Thank you.